In this video, we're going to add a little bit of sizzle to our force field with a subtle electrical effect that we can make dance across the surface. To do this, we'll learn how to use another node that we haven't seen yet called the step node. We can reproduce this effect with a noise texture combined with the step function coupled with some extra basic math. Because the effect is really almost a separate entity added on top of the force field, we're going to make it a subgraph and then combine it with the force field shader graph later. For now, we'll make a temporary material to hold our electrical shader, then just visualize it over a gray background. This effect relies on some kind of noise pattern, and I already have a seamless electrical texture downloaded from a website called textures4photoshop.com. You can search there for more free textures or just use one of the several noise patterns that I've included in the resources. Whatever you use, just make sure that the texture is seamless and tileable. Import the noise pattern of your choice into the project. Asset, import new asset. And this is called electric lightning texture seamless and the default settings for import are fine. Now, once we have that, create a new subgraph. Right click, create shader subgraph and let's call it edge noise subgraph. Open the shader graph window by clicking the subgraph asset. And our first order of business is just to drop in a texture 2D asset and put texture, texture 2D asset. Select our seamless electrical image. Now we'll connect this almost immediately to a sample texture 2D asset to convert the texture to RGB values. And now that we know how the tiling and offset node works, we can add one of those, then plug that into our UV input port. Let's reserve a couple of properties for the tiling and offset in the blackboard. And I'll just call them exactly that, tiling and offset. They're both vector twos. The tiling can default to one and one, and the offset, just leave it at zero, zero. Drag those into your graph and then connect them into their respective ports. Now the next node, the step node, is the magic that makes this all work. Math, round, and there's tons of little rounding operations in here, and we want the one that's called the step. And that's just a really simple math function. Again, per usual, you can always right click over the node to open documentation. And according to the docs, this step node returns one if the value of the input in is greater than the value of the input edge. Otherwise, it returns zero. We want to connect the sample texture 2D to the edge input port, but be careful. We don't want to drag all four RGBA channels into the edge. One channel will work just fine. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of extra information that we don't need in this case. Because the image is mostly blue, let's connect the blue channel to the edge input port. And just like we read, the step node is a math function that simply classifies values as either one or zero, true or false. And it does this based on comparing each value with the second input port. If the value that we have set for this in port is greater than whatever we find in the edge, and that's the texture, we get a value of one. If it's less, then we get a value of zero. Shader graph represents these values in the preview as black and white pixels. So you'll see the thumbnail is pure black or pure white with no grayscales in between. And the resulting black and white pixels depend on what value we have set in the import. Use a large in value and the whole thumbnail will turn white. Because the blue channel from the sample texture has a range of zero to one, if you set the in value close to one, most of the image will turn white because the in value is guaranteed to be greater. Likewise, if you set the in value to zero, most of the image turns black because there aren't any values in the original texture that are less than the value of in. As you modify the in value, you're going to start seeing some black and white noise patterns appear in the preview window. So let's try, say, 0.2 or 0.3. The electrical texture becomes something like this. So let's add a slot to the subgraph outputs and then connect your step node. And here's a result of our subgraph previewed on a sphere. Now, mostly it's white with black speckles, but don't worry, we're not gonna leave it that way. But we're at a point where we should see what this looks like on a real object in our game view. So save the asset, 
And let's go back to the editor. This is a subgraph and it doesn't exist on its own. We're going to need to use it inside of another shader graph. So create a new PBR graph. Right click, create, shader, PBR graph. And it's only going to be temporary, so I'll just call it temp shader graph. And let's switch our force field matte material temporarily to use this temp shader graph shader. Our sphere turns medium gray. Okay, good. That's what we expect. And now let's edit the temp shader graph. We have a blank PBR shader with just a master node. And let's add a new node. It will be inside of this blank group that should say subgraphs. Select the edge noise subgraph that we just created. Let's drop that into the shader graph. We want to plug this into the emission port of the PBR master, but probably not directly as that will just look black and gray like this. Instead, let's multiply it by color. Create a mass basic multiply node. And we can connect this, but we'll need something to multiply it with. Let's create a color property on the blackboard and switch the mode to HDR. Pick a nice color for electricity. I always think of it as a bluish white. And using a really high intensity with the HDR will glow nicely with our post processing. So I'll set the default intensity to something like plus four. Drag this color property into the shader graph and then connect that into our multiply node. Hook up the output of the multiply into the emission port of the PBR master. And now our preview shows a nice light blue. We can't really visualize the glow here without the post-processing. So we do need to go back to the editor. Let's save the asset and then go back there. With the default plus four intensity, the sphere is glowing a lot. Knock that down a bit and you'll see our default texture on our sphere. And that's not the look that we're going for, of course. The material is mostly white with these little islands cut out. Instead, what we want is to trace the outlines of those little noise patterns. And we want a lot less of the texture glowing. The general shape of the noise is good. It's nice and organic, but we want the edges of the noise pattern and not so much of the texture filled in. Otherwise, when you crank up the intensity, it looks like this. Go back to the edge noise subgraph. And the trick to grabbing the edges of the pattern that results from the step node is actually to use two different step nodes with slightly different in values. And then we can just take the difference of them. All right, so I'll just do that and you'll see what I mean. Add another step node into our graph right below the other one. Connect the sample texture 2D output into this step node as well. And this time, let's change the in value to something a little bit bigger. Our first step node used a value of 0 0.2. On this node, let's try something like 0 0.3. Make a basic math node to subtract the resulting values. Math basic subtract. And we want to subtract the step node with the smaller in value from the step node with the larger value. So we'll probably need to crisscross the inputs here. And let me rearrange the nodes so they make a little more sense visually. And now you'll see that we have a new pattern where we have just some really noisy representation of the edges, almost like fuzzy contour lines. Connect this into our output slot, and that should create a pattern much closer to what our goal was. Okay, save the asset. Let's check it out in the editor. Because our temp shader graph is already using the edge noise subgraph, our scene should update automatically. And now you'll see something that looks more like little glowing embers or electrical sparks. Compare that side by side with what we had before. And you can see the difference is that we're only cutting out the edges from the noise this time. With the HDR color, we can pump up the intensity or just tone it down to your liking. Go ahead and pick a color for a different look. But I may just go back to my boring sci-fi blue. Currently, we're using hard-coded values to determine our shader effect, and we probably want to expose them as a couple of properties instead. Because most of the work is being done in the subgraph, we do need to set up two sets of properties. Let's first go to the subgraph, and here, let's set up two vector one properties on the blackboard, and I'll call the first property cutoff, 
That will describe the threshold for the in value of the step function. And let's use 0 0.2 for the default. And the other property that we want to set up is thickness. This is going to be how much we offset the other step node. In our current example, we're using 0 0.3 for the other node, and the thickness is a difference, so I'll just default the thickness to 0 0.1. Drop the cutoff property into the graph, then feed this directly into the bottom step node. For the top step node, we need to add the thickness to the cutoff value using a math node. Math, basic add, add the thickness and cutoff values together. And let's position these nodes on screen so they make sense. Connect those up, and that goes into the top in value. Now we should have what we had before, except now we can adjust the properties for a bit more flexibility. Go ahead and change the values in the blackboard if you'd like, and you can modify the edge noise as we tweak the cutoff value, and you can make the noise more dense and visible when you dial up the thickness. Play with both of those for a little bit and then save this asset. Now remember that the blackboard in the subgraph doesn't show up in the inspector. We're just using those properties to change the node's available inputs. In order to expose properties in the materials inspector window, we need to edit the temp material as well. So let's go there. You'll see that we have our two extra ports from the edge noise subgraph. That's what we just set up in the blackboard of the subgraph and they start with our previously created defaults. To expose the properties in the inspector, we need to add two vector ones in this blackboard, and we can just use the same names, cut off and thickness. Just throw in some default values. It doesn't really matter what they are for now. And just connect everything up, drag these into the graph, and once again, drop them into their respective ports. Save the asset, and then go back to the editor. We now have two properties in the material inspector that you can tweak around to change the cutoff and thickness values. Play around with those until you make a neat pattern that you sort of like. Your mileage can vary depending on how prominent you want the energy effect to look, but experiment until you get something suitable to your taste. Now, once you've got it the way that you want it, the next step is to add some subtle motion. Not a lot of animation, but just something so it's not so static. Currently, it resembles glowing veins of marble, and mostly it looks okay, but some movement in there would really help make it more interesting. Now, you can almost see how this would work if you could just add a little bit of animation to the cutoff value. If you drag that around, it almost does what we need. We just need to figure out how to add some nodes in our subgraph to make that move on its own without manual intervention. Now, this is a great time to implement this feature as your challenge. It's only a few extra nodes, but you'll need to use what you've learned over the last few videos. And you can do most of this with just the time and the sign nodes. Just adding some kind of cyclical motion should be enough to make it less static. As a hint, you probably also need a remap node in here as well. And there are a couple of different ways of setting this up, but I think I would recommend changing the cutoff property to a vector two. And that way you can use it to define two boundaries of a whole range instead of just one static value. You probably also want to expose a property to control the speed of the sine wave while you're in there. Call it frequency or something like that, and then modify how fast the sine wave oscillates with this frequency property. Okay, so try that on your own. Pause playback. We'll resume in the next part where we show you one solution to make our electrical effect come alive.